All right, we're back for another program, and this is another uh, exciting edition of A Neighbor's Choice, but it's also going to have a deep dive of uh, anthropology as well, and that's because we're talking to two fellow students of Rene Girard of Mimetic Theory. We have our friend Surat Desgupta, who's a writer and editor at A Neighbor's Choice, joining us, and we also have Jason Jones, who's a frequent guest, and he is a, a, a activist and a human rights campaign uh advocate and he's the author of the new book the great campaign against the great reset which is out very soon it's going to be released on april 16th and uh, i wanted to have you guys both on because recently uh i saw a um a, uh, an appearance you made on cbn jason where you were talking about something going on in india my audience is not very familiar with what's going on so i just want to have you guys both both christians both Girardians, as we call it, students of Girard, dive into this topic about what's going on with Indian nationalism and uh, Christians. Well, I appreciate you having me on, uh, David. And in fact, I'm, I'm glad to be on with Surat because confession, um, I don't know that much about the persecution of the church in India. And so I'm excited to talk to Surat. And, and I'd like to also talk to him about Girard's little book that he wrote, Sacrifice, on Hinduism, which um, I have never read, and hopefully maybe Srit has read it. But uh, uh, Well, I, I haven't read that either, so okay. but I can give my own uh, personal opinion. Uh, I would love to talk to you about that because I actually own it, but I have not read it yet, and it's very tiny. But the reason, and then maybe we can open it up to Srit, so the reason I wrote this article was I noticed sort of two things happening at the same time. I, I work serving persecuted communities around the world, not just Christians, um, but I, I, I know that there's been a rise in attacks, not just on Christians, but on Muslims in India, while at the same time, I've noticed that the Hindu nationalists have become increasingly more engaged in domestic American politics, and they've been, they've been engaged on the right. And the way that the Zionists have controlled discourse on Israel's abuse of Christians in the United States. We can't talk about Israel funding, uh, supporting Azerbaijan's ethnic cleansing of Artsakh, for example, or the abuse that the Armenian Christians in the old city have suffered recently having a church stolen from them, or the intentional targeting of uh, one of Mother Teresa's uh, homes for dis uh, un unwanted, discarded and elderly and sick children in Gaza that was ignored by the press or the two. So when I, I saw this, I'm like, oh my gosh, like the last thing I want is the Hindu nationalists to gain the level of access and influence to the American right that the Israeli lobby has. And then we see that the Western church is silent on the persecution of Christians in um, India the way they have been silent on the abuse of Christians by Israel or sort of sort of the leftover um, unintended consequences of sort of foreign policy decisions in the Middle East, like the ethnic cleansing of Christians and Yazidis in Iraq, um, uh, stupid policies like regime change of Assad that would have left 800,000 Christians and Alawites dead or displaced. And so I thought, you know, what? we need to cut the Hindu nationalists off at the pass. Uh, we need to awaken the church in the West to the abuse that Christians are facing at the hands of Hindu nationalism um, with the rise of Hindu nationalism. And at the same time, we need to really block their influence um, on the Western conservative movement and not just in the United States, but I fear even more so in Europe because, and maybe Savat uh, can speak more to this, the... Um, sort of the strange history of the racialist rights fascination with Hinduism. Uh, I have this book from 1922 called Hindutva, which just came in, which is sort of like a foundational document of Hindu nationalism. And you can notice right there, the swat, you know, the swastika on the cover. Um, the Nazis, of course, obviously had a fascination with Hinduism as an Aryan religion and uh, Guanan and, and, and others uh, in the continental right. So yeah, that's why I wrote the article. 
And maybe that's a lot of information, but I'll just leave it there for you guys. Uh, the the booklet that you showed me, it, is the name of that author Savarkar? Um, yeah. Sav so the, the author's name is, um, yes, Savakar. Um, yeah. Vinayak Numander Savakar. Uh, yeah, yeah, he he was a pretty controversial character to say the least. Uh, there's a big push for uh, you know his name to be rehabilitated in our current historical discourse, despite the fact that this guy is known to have you know uh, signed a lot of confessions when he was being imprisoned. Uh, he signed an agreement with the British during that time and uh is like he was notorious for being known uh to belong in circles which were pretty traitorous and so you know so on like they betrayed the uh, uh the freedom movement at every turn so uh, but yeah like that's probably a much lengthier topic and uh you're right about the the uh fascination with hinduism uh the the uh right wing or you know the the kind of ethno nationalistic uh connection to that and the reason that uh it has that connection is because you know i need to speak from a girardian's perspective here is that uh, it's like you know what uh the things like nazism and all of that is is basically uh a nietzschean uh you know attempt to overturn the uh christian uh uh, cultural influence that it's spreading right like the margin for victims and the, this uh these people who uh say that they are fans of Nietzsche they they like to you know uh they proclaim this philosophy of you know might makes right so they're pretty morally uh relativistic they don't really adhere to any standards on of objective morality so that's why you know uh you notice, uh, like when when you are seeing the uh, these Hindu nationalists speak, you will often see them vacillate, you know, going back and forth between might makes right, and then at the same time, you know, portraying themselves as some kind of victims in in history, right? Like they will often say, like the state that India is in right now is because of the British, and uh, they will blame the poverty uh, levels on the British. They will blame the uh, the slums, you know, the enormous slums in India that and blame that on the British, uh, the unhygienic, uh, you know, atmosphere that is present everywhere you go. Even that is the fault of the British. So it's a scapegoating method and it's very reminiscent of, you know, uh, groups like Black Lives Matter and all of these, like they were, uh, the Hoteps and all of these groups. is. They claim that they were once living in a golden age and now it's because of these uh, uh, these foreign influences, uh, they are in the shape that they're in. So uh, that's very uh, interesting. I wonder where they get that from. So you know, like <laughs> it's it's uh, it even get, becomes much more obvious. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the the infiltration of the Hindu nationalist uh, elements into American politics, and I think that's not uh, a coincidence. That's by design because a lot of these Hindu nationalists are. Uh, you know, they might be cosplaying, you know, LARPing as Hindu nationals, you know, in order to satisfy their Hindu Hindu voter banks. But but they're really uh, globalists uh, at the in you know in every way. You know, look at what happened during the pandemic era. So like uh, India had some of the worst pandemic restrictions you can imagine, where people were like you where villagers, you know, poor rural vi villagers were just you know forcefully vaccinated at uh, uh on the streets they were hit in with, they were hit, hit with uh sticks when if they violated the curfew you know if they violated the lockdown rules doesn't seem so pro hindu if you look at it uh they're also you know pretty much pro uh depopulation uh the education are you know he heavily funded by the bill and melinda gates foundation uh the uh um, the vaccines are have been uh, you know borrowed from you know AstraZeneca you know all of these globalist uh, entities and uh, you can also see the side effects taking place so 
yeah they're very much uh, allied with the globalists and uh, they have a, a singular agenda and that is to undermine what makes the west so free is that uh, and and i wouldn't and i don't think it's a coincidence that they target christianity wherever they are in the world so you're you're saying the globalists wink at hindu nation hindu nationalism just serves a utility and that yes. anything that removes those authentic defenders of the vulnerable Christians or weakens them or marginalizes them is acceptable to the globalists. I would say so. The pattern is easily recognizable wherever you go in the world. Uh, these, uh, like if you see, for example, you mentioned, uh, if we talk Artsakh. about Ukraine, yeah, Artsakh, you know, uh, uh, our Ukraine and all of these other places, all of the Christian communities are always uh, at the you know receiving end of the the, the violence, and uh, you know like and all of these globalist entities making forays into these regions, like say for say as example BlackRock, BlackRock has been uh, entering heavily into the Indian market, uh, allying themselves with all of these big corporations who are very uh, you know known for being big donors to the hindu nationalist party so uh, there is just no like a, a lot of people in india don't know about this because they have been really heavily brainwashed into you know becoming statists and just blind you know uh, blindly listening and believing whatever the mainstream media says uh, so that's the tragedy of it all is that a lot of people play very easily into the, in the into these dialectics like it's always Hindus versus Muslims or Hindus versus Christians but it's never like we are never uh, you know allowed to focus on the real problems which are the invasion of the agricultural uh, industry, the invasion of the pharmaceutical industry and the uh, systematic breakdown of, you know, small businesses and so on and so forth. Now, do you see a difference um, in how the is, is is there a difference in how the Christians for the first century Christian communities are treated to how the newer uh, Christian communities uh, in northeast India are treated? Is there a difference and what accounts for this difference? Well, uh, it's very, uh, very difficult to say because the first Christian communities uh, sprang up in South India. That was the region where St. Thomas uh, landed. So uh, St. Thomas was uh, a disciple of Jesus. He was very well known to be the doubting Thomas, you know, the one who asked uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the evidence for Jesus raising up from the dead. And he was martyred in India and uh, uh, he was hunted down by a mob and shot with an arrow. Uh, and uh, but he but the Christian community, uh, the church he, that he founded there flourished to a certain extent until it became uh, very, uh, you know, what's the word for it? Secretistic. Very, Yes, a syncretistic and very it started the membership uh, started declining, and it was only after the uh, the Western countries uh, started colonizing India, like countries you have countries like France, Portugal, and British, uh, uh, and the Brit British entering India, where you see a resurgence of uh, Christian evangelization. And a lot of these uh, evangelization were not really taken, you know, they were not really carried out on behalf of the state. They were done by uh, dedicated self-sacrificing mi missionaries. You know, we can mention uh, uh, people like William Carey, who was a well-known uh, uh, Protestant missionary who helped, uh, who was uh, single-handedly actually uh, responsible for developing the languages of India and, uh, you know, all of the like uh, public education and all of these uh, other stuff, hospitals, uh, the Catholic missionaries also had a lot of important contributions in that regard. In fact, if you, even today, if you see uh, the, the most prestigious schools in India, 
they belong to the the Catholic communities, like the, the convent schools, and uh, also of course you also mentioned Mother Teresa's contribution. So the I, I know a bit. I went to uh, into a bit of a uh, other topic there, but you asked about whether any difference in the treatment of Christians uh, back then and now. Uh, we didn't have. Uh, a no, widespread... what I would say is there is there a difference in, um how the Christians, for example, in Malabar or in the South are treated uh, compared to the Christians in the Northeast? Do we see that the Hindu nationalists treat them differently? Yeah. So I can only give my own personal experience. So I, I, I didn't, I haven't lived for an extended period of time in the Northeast, but uh, as per my own experience, I've lived in North India and uh, right now I'm living in Bengal. So that's in the east, uh, pretty close to the northeast. So in North India, uh, there's widespread, uh, very tribalistic uh, attitude towards Christian Christians. But in in regions like Bengal, uh, where I live, uh, and this is because of the influence of the British uh, administra administrators and cultures, uh, there's a much more liberal attitude towards Christianity here where I'm living and in the Northeast, these the people in the Northeast were notorious for being, you know, very tribalistic. They're like, uh, there's a tribe over there who were uh, known for being, for, for head hunting, you know, and uh, all, a lot of these tribes were uh, converted to Christianity by missionaries. And uh, so, at the outset, you have a tribalistic uh, hostility among the various uh, peoples over there. And on top of that, you have an added element of religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, hostility. So I would say like it's very, it has escalated in recent years because of the rise of Hindu nationalism, the rise of Hindu brazenness of Hindu, Hindu nationalism. And of course, the tribalistic nature that already existed before that. Is that the same Uttar Pradesh where they were doing all this stuff? No, that was, that's U a different place. U Uttar Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh is uh, a very Hindu majority uh, state, and uh, there aren't many. Like there could be tribes over there. I'm not uh, so sure about it, but the, it's it's overtly Hindu over there, and. Uh, it's a very backward state as well uh, because the literacy rate is very low and the poverty le levels are sky high. The population level is sky high. It's, 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 that's why you have a lot of people migrating from that state towards uh, all other states, including uh, state place where I live in. And uh, but they did very yeah. well with the pandemic because they rejected the the greatest drug ever created and they accepted ivermectin, right? Yeah, uh, but that was because of the doctors. Uh, yeah. That one that was not the uh, Uttar Pradesh right now is ruled by the uh, Hindu nationalist uh, government, and the person who is the who is the ruler over there is, uh, very very openly, uh, you know, aggressive towards all the other religions like. He has made inflammatory speeches about, you know, killing Muslims, killing Christians. And he seems to get away with that because the media here is captured by the Hindu Nationalist Party. And uh, but uh, he was trying to become a candidate for the, uh, the 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 prime minister of India. But I don't think he will be very successful because of his appearance. He gives off. He, he has an appearance like a. <laughs> Like a like an uneducated Hindu monk, you know, it's not good a image for the country. Jason, what, what? Why did you take an interest in this topic again on the CBN channel? You were talking about wanting to raise awareness for this with your movement and your project because of this new law. I'm not familiar with this law. Can you explain a little bit about that? Um. Yeah. Which was the new law at the time we were talking about? Was it the 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 new law they passed that's going to make it hard for uh, Christians to do healing, right? What is the? Oh yeah, so th that's in the Northeast. So the, specifically, they've been suffering more persecution. Um, yeah, because for their prayers for healing or petitionary prayers would be banned, and that seems specifically 
targeted at the sort of newer Christian communities, the Protestant Christian communities um, in the Northeast. And so that's why I asked the question. It does seem to me that sort of the newer Protestant communities and the more heterodox communities are suffering the greatest abuse. Yes, because they're the ones who tend to grow more rapidly, uh, especially when uh, you look at uh, movements like the charismatics, right? Uh, they're, the, they're very aggressive and evangelizing. They're very aggressive, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, uh, when I used to be in contact with a lot of my Hindu nationalist friends, they would often show me these uh, videos of, you know, faith healers doing weird stuff, you know, Benny Hinn level kind of stuff. And back then I already uh, knew that where this was all going because this was something that they were circulating amongst themselves to, yeah. you know, paint a picture that Christians are these weird <laughs> cultic people uh, who are, you know, uh, pretty icky, you yeah. know, to deal with. So, uh, but I, uh, but I could see them, you know, enacting this kind, these kinds of laws. I mean, already there were multiple laws that are that are anti-Christian explicitly. Like you have many of uh, in many of the states of India, you have anti-conversion laws. So you can't convert to Christianity by law in many uh, Indian states, uh, regardless of, you know, if you're doing it voluntarily or, you know, by compulsion, you just you just can't. And many people have to uh, therefore do it in a very discreet manner you know yes now how does hinduism and gerard i mean gerard wrote um an entire book uh, small though it may be on hinduism you neither of us have read it but you said you have your own ideas on sort of scapegoat theory and hinduism well i i I wouldn't say it as, these are new ideas. It's just uh, applying the basics of Girard to the religion. And uh, one of the things that, you know, a society, a pre-Christian society operates is to, you know, keep it heavily sacrificial, right? And by that, I mean, you know, uh, enforce very rigid boundaries. For example, the caste system and, uh, uh, you know, uh, persecuting or you know discriminating against uh, female the female gender. So uh, if you if you looked at uh, uh, some of these Hindu uh, images, uh, their objects of worship, the idols, there are many goddesses uh, that they worship, right? And uh, that's like a symbol of you know strength. And it's very ironic that the symbol of strength is a female deity who is uh, very portrayed as a, in a very aggressive manner. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like you have this notion of you can't help but notice that the female uh, gender is abstract, you know, it, and, uh, you know, in its divinity, it's abstract. But when it comes down to earthly levels, you have things like female infanticide. You have things like uh, sati, which which is you know the widow uh, of the deceased husband. You know, burning into the uh, you know jumping into the funeral uh, pyre of the of the you know of the husband, jumping into the the burning dead body of the husband, in so that she sacrifices herself. Like her life has no meaning after the death of her husband. And you have child uh, marriage, and you have uh, you have the dowry system, which is uh, if you are like if you are the parent of a daughter and you are giving your daughter away in a marriage, you have to give uh, also to to the family of the husband uh, bridegroom a large uh, amount of money, which is uh, a lot. You know they spend their whole life saving up that money. So you have all of these practices and, uh, you know, if you ask a Hindu person uh, or a Hindu nationalist about these things, uh, they'll often, you know, defend themselves by saying that, uh, no, no, these are not true. This is like you're relying on British data to, to, uh, to make these narratives, but uh, reality is just the opposite.
so you could see if, like if you look at anthropologically you could see many of the same themes of rene girard uh the sacrif the sacrificial you know of keeping of or keeping uh, distinctions between different communities different castes it's all it's always sacrificial it always involves uh, bloodshed of uh, some kind right so if another person if a person of a lower caste is caught with a person of a higher caste there's uh, the punishment for that is human sacrifice right it's mob lynching so these are the things like the sacrificial uh, so mob lynching things. still happening today is the is the vestige of their older form of the sacrifice right yeah it's it, it's the it's way, the folk yeah. medicine it's the natural way to start a fire right? yes it's i mean look looking at it objectively it's the way that societies keep themselves in order they used to keep themselves in order through all of these right i mean even even in the old testament we could see different tribes you know not eating with each other you know not taking part in meals be between each other and um, you could say that christianity is seen as a threat because christianity threatens to unravel that sacrificial uh you know tension you know that sacrificial distinction that's enforced by uh, the the people in places of privilege and christianity threatens to do away with all of that thing especially if you see in you know in i'll give you an example uh, in, in in india in many of these rural places you won't often see vegetarians uh, religious vegetarians and non vegetarians having meals with each other they won't even share a drop of uh, water you know a glass of water with each other they 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 consider that a sacrilege if you do that do those kinds of things but if you go into that kind of environment and if you tell them a story like saint peter uh eating with a gentile like cornelius and uh, you know god saying do not consider these things unclean you know like you, and you see the passages like uh Galatians, where they say no, Jew, they they won't be. There's there's no more Gentile, no more Jew, no more male, female. That you could see how, very blatantly how that how that is a threat threat to that kind of uh, society. Those kind of passages they threat uh, they threaten the very way of living for these communities. So that's why you know it's a, when you see these. Uh, uh, you know, persecutions in the rural areas of India, that's like a knee-jerk reaction that they are doing uh, when they are exposed to uh, Christian teaching. How much of the violence from the Hindu nationalism is out of its own ideology, books like the Hindutva and Hinduism, and how much of it is like mimetic escalation because of the collisions with Islamist violence? That's an interesting question. I, I would say both are uh, very large contributing factors. And, uh, you know, H Hinduism is often seen, like you said, uh, Jason, in that interview we did, uh, Hinduism is often seen as a peaceful religion, but it's really not. I mean, uh, if you look at the, uh, if you read the religious te text, for example, one of the biggest religious texts of uh the Hindus is the the Mahabharata, which is a mythology of uh, that has to do a lot with how India, you know, f was uh, the the concept of the Indian land was founded, right? And you could see throughout those scriptures uh, of of Hinduism numerous uh, commandments to kill the enemy, to rob the enemy, and to th those are considered noble. In some regards, so there is a warrior caste in India, right? Uh, one of the upper upper castes, and uh, the reason they are considered, uh, you know, one of the upper castes is because by by ancestry and by by the caste system itself, they are endowed with the task of you know fighting wars, and uh, you don't see that kind of stuff in a in a, in Christianity because Christianity abhors violence. 
Christianity is a non-violent religion. So, and uh, yeah, uh, regarding the Islamic Islamist factor, uh, I would say the Islam the Islamic invasions had a lot of influence on the Indian culture, especially uh, you know, also among Hindu cultures. You know whether they want to admit it or not. The Parda system. Uh, uh, are you familiar with that, Jason? The Parda, you know, like when you speak with a woman uh, in these rural areas, they will often cover their faces. So that that can be linked to the hijab practices in a, in Islam, right? So it uh, and uh, I mean, if you look at the temples that were created in pre-Islamic times. You could see like many of these temples have nude figures all over them, all over the temples, right? Like that's where you get the things like the Kama Sutra and all of those stuff from, right? So that was not really a taboo subject back then. But post-Islamic India, you could see uh, the, the, the taboo of uh, women's uh, modesty, you know, taking a lot of uh, uh, being from moved into the front and center of culture so yeah i think that, i think oh, that sorry, the sacred yeah. cow probably my theory is it originated as like creating a mimetic crisis of competition over the consumption of scarce meat and how nutritious it is and delicious it is and they kind of had like a a detente like let's nobody eat this okay let's do something else because you know, the whole, the envy of like, I'm devouring a cow with my people and I don't get to have a piece of that. And that, you know what I mean? Like that creates a lot of, in my opinion, uh, contagious envy and conflict that can go, can go nuts you know, when you're hungry. Can so, I tell you a funny story about that? Yeah. To your point? Yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting point. And maybe it's some people thought and written about this a lot. I've never even thought of it. I've always wondered why would you, um, I can hear Cat Williams in the back of my head. It's called the holy cow theory of uh, when, when, Gronowski. when Get, Cat Williams is like, why he would never become Muslim. He's like, cause pigs are delicious. Um, <laughs> um, I could hear, I could hear Cat Williams going, but cows are delicious. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, when I was in Sudan during the genocide, I had met with the Janjaweed, the devils on horseback. Uh, my mm -hmm. partners and I, we, we went across the El Arab river we were taken there by the SPLA. This was before independence in South Sudan. And so the S uh, Sudanese People's Liberation Army took us to the sort of the battlefront, which was a river, and they pulled us across. Um, the Janjaweed's uh, folks pulled us across on barrels. And when we were meeting with the Janjaweed, you know, asking them why they were raiding across the river, um, killing the, the the people on the other side of the river, we asked them to stop that, you know, and the, and the one of the Janjaweed said, well, but they keep stealing our cows. Yeah. And I'd asked the translator, I'm like, are your, your, your people stealing their cows? And he said, yeah, that's what we do. We steal cows. <laughs> and uh, so there, I, there may be something to your point, you know, that you take the most valuable thing that people are killing each other over and you're like, this is set aside. This is set apart and we're not going to fight over this. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's a way of, it's a, it's a way of the pagan cultic way of dealing with violence in a way that can make, if you it. could put cows and women us out, I think we would be, have complete peace. That, that's why, you know, like mm -hmm. the whole bar effect, right? When there's a higher ratio of men in a bar to women, they can get a little bit more violent. So they want to always, that's why clubs like to make sure the ratio is predominantly one woman, you know, to male so that <laughs> there's not as much violence and bad behavior. Right. Or at least, or at least have like a, you know, um, sorry, men, uh, mm -hmm. we couldn't keep the ratio 50, 50. So we're going to have bacon cheeseburgers, 50% off. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get in any fights, man. We're going to have bacon cheeseburgers for everyone. Yeah, exactly. And then that last guy that doesn't get it, he's grumpy, and he's going to start looking at people and start, yep. Jason, you've dealt with that as a karate master. Aren't Dude, you? It's like, where has this conversation gone? <laughs> I, where have I gone? Why am I on this program? <laughs> are we said it, Jason, are, are you going to go to India next? Is that your next mission? You know, I will be in India this summer. Um, I'm going to be traveling quite a bit this summer. 
Um, are you doing an eat, pray, love? Are you doing an eat, pray, love seminar? I, I, you know, I will eat a lot. I will pray a lot and we will be traveling because of love. Yes. So we, uh, I'll be in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, Congo, and then Spain. <laughs> We're shooting a movie in Spain this summer as well. We're hosting a conference in Nigeria. We are working with a Dalit school in India. I'm going to visit the school. Also, we're working on um, some medical center clinics in Congo. So I'll be visiting those. Um, yeah, so it's going to be quite a busy um, summer. And then now my book, my book comes out next week, uh, The Great Campaign Against the Great Reset. And so that's going to keep me pretty busy on my media and book tour for the next so what are week. some of the patterns of that we've discussed about globalism using the the garb of nationalism in India that are related to the themes of your book? Well, I think why you'll especially like the book, David. Have you read it yet? You've had it for a long time. Yes, yes. But it's a Girardian look at the Great Reset, and what I mean by that is, you know, I'm not looking at the Great Reset through the lens of politics or economics or governance. Obviously, there are elements of the Great Reset that touch all of those. But I think what makes the Great Reset really horrifying is its scope, um, its totality. It's it's as it's as virulent as uh, communism, you know, in that it it seeks to obliterate the understanding of the human person that that uh, what we call the West was grounded in since the second person of the Trinity became man. And so what the Great Reset seeks to do is wipe away that sort of very profound respect for the human person um, that you find in Christianity, that its remnants still echo through the West. The West is, of course, is and will always be Christ-haunted. Um, and so it's a rejection fundamentally of that vision of the human person. Um, I say in my introduction to young Americans, more than wanting your property, um, the Great Reset wants your heart. Uh, it wants to change fundamentally. Obama said he wants to fundamentally change America, which is to fundamentally change something, obviously, is to destroy it. If you change something fundamentally, if you obviously, if you change a thing's nature, which you cannot change a thing's nature, you can destroy a thing. And so they they are very open about it, especially in the transhumanist community about sort of blowing up the idea of the human person that we we hold to right and, and what you probably find most intriguing is i look at victimism as the fundamental instrument of control that the globalists use yeah. um feigning concern for the vulnerable to acquire yeah. wealth and power and prestige um uh surit might find this interesting i wrote an article recently where i compared them to the bastard, and I called them the bastard children of the British East Indies Company. They use the same strategies. They use the same tactics. Yes. They have the, the same disdain for the for the for these communities around the world. They, they use this natural sense of empathy that people have for these communities. But what they really seek to do is absolutely destroy them. It's divide and conquer, right? Uh, yeah. the age-old uh, game and uh, it's uh, you that's how you know that these are the spiritual successors of the the colonialists of old is uh they employ the same tactic of you know pitting races against races religions against religions and uh, they have a very uh uh, you know, common thread in their attacks in that they attack the human person, they attack the individuals, and that's why they seem to have a hard time coexisting with Christianity, is because Christianity gives you the grounding of that, that idea that all human life is intrinsically valuable, and uh, all persons are created uniquely uh, in the image of God. So uh, that's why they are completely fine. They're completely okay to ally themselves with uh, Islamists, with Hindu nationalists. Yeah, it's true. And with, uh, you know, all of these... Uh, Zionists, uh, Zionist, Zionist, you know, Hindu nationalists, yeah. Islamists, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nazra. 
Yeah. By the way, Hitler himself, right, was repulsed by Christianity, said it was a great tragedy that Germany wasn't Islam uh, Muslim. And he himself was fascinated um, by Eastern religion as well uh, and Nietzsche. But at the end of the day, this idea that we would marshal strength and power and influence in the service of the vulnerable or the weak is absolutely reprehensible to these people. Yeah. 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 But they but they weaponize and it's they weaponize. they weaponize female empathy towards the vulnerable as their number one. Let's be let's be clear, Jason. You know, that's the biggest issue is that victimism is the heresy single, of the age. And we have a pope who is a victimist heretic. Yeah. 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 But single women are the biggest fans of this religion of victimism. So how do, how does the church start to talk to them in a way that they can under you know can understand how they're being conned you know by their emotions? Do you talk about that in your book? I do, and you know it's the chapter on solidarity. So there, you know, we have the five ideologies of control, and then those five sort of pillars of the West that if we um, adhere to those, the Great Reset will crumble as totalitarianism, communism, and fascism, and Nazism as well perished, um, but it's it's authentic solidarity. Yeah. Um, and we have to, you know, my one goal with this book is, and it's it's doing pretty, you know, it comes out in a, a week and a half, but the pre-sales have been kind of startlingly good. Um, but my one goal is that it's a Gerard word. Gerard, I believe, coined the word in the mid '90s. It's the word victimism. I want that word in the dictionary. It's not in the dictionary. Yeah. I want people to use the word victimism as much as they use the word gaslighting, because when they sell us open borders, they're gaslighting us, right? They they, they sell us open borders because they care so much about migrants. Wait, what? No, their open border policy lures millions and millions and millions of migrants away from their family, disintegrating their families and their communities, breaking them apart in Guatemala, Honduras, yeah. across Central and South America, yeah. luring family members into a dangerous yeah. underground economy by the millions. Um, also fentanyl pouring across the open borders, killing vulnerable Americans, the, uh, the, the, the most vulnerable Americans wages, uh, especially new legal immigrants wages are undermined. Um, but they use concern for the migrant to sell policies that undermine not only migrants here, but their families abroad. Yeah. So uh, same thing with the war in Ukraine. You know, I was advocating a ceasefire the day the war started and said this is a grift that Ukraine is being used by the West to gut Russia, that Ukraine will get nothing for this but uh, burying a generation of its boys, which we're seeing. Um, but they sold concern for the people of Ukraine to get us to support a war that undermined the interests of the people of Ukraine. Yeah. In fact, the point where Boris Johnson sabotaged a ceasefire arrangement eight weeks after the war started, which yeah. utterly diabolical. You think of the electric car. Um, King Charles in his Christmas address called for climate compassion. We shouldn't let war and hunger distract us from having compassion for the climate, whatever that means. Meanwhile, boys as young as six years old, are digging for cobalt by hand in Congo so you can drive your Tesla with its coexist bumper sticker. Utterly and absolutely reprehensible. So victimism is the mechanism that these, and I really love the way Surat called them, the spiritual children of the, of the colonialist, of the imperialist, because that's what they are. And it is spiritual in the sense that it's diabolical and we're talking about principalities and powers to have 3 million Uyghurs picking cotton for American brands. And then you have NBA players wearing jerseys with Uyghur cotton, taking a knee during the national anthem. This is victimism. This is reprehensible. This is where you have, you know, do gooder leftist neighbors lecturing you because you have an internal combustion engine in your truck. And meanwhile, they're driving that environmental catastrophe, the electric car. The battery's disgusting and horrible for the environment. Its tires uh, put more particles in the air than my exhaust pipe on my pickup truck ever will. And that's not even the 
beginning of the problems of the electric car, it's it's catastrophic to the environment. It's real problem is it's a human rights catastrophe. But these do-gooders are driving the electric vehicles around because they drinking they're drinking the victimist Kool Aid. And so Rene Girard in the '90s gave us the language. You know, even a lot of Girardians, and I wonder if you both would think about this. They're victimists. I have to say, some of the most prominent Girardians, I find their writing reprehensible. And you see in Gil Bailey and Rene Girard's later writing, I believe a conscious attempt to nail them down, to 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 protect us from the temptation of look. I would like to be a victimist, right? Victimism comes with wealth and power and prestige, and people tell you you're great, and you can probably even convince yourself that you're great, right? You can lie to yourself. Yeah. Uh, authentic solidarity comes with stones to your head, uh, handcuffs oftentimes, or a knife to the back of your neck. Um, as Gerard taught us, to serve the vulnerable means that you will become indistinguishable to the mob from that vulnerable person you're standing next to. You become indistinguishable to the adulteress that you're kneeling next to or the leper that you just kissed. So if you want to kiss lepers and you want to kneel down next to women caught in the act of adultery, you should expect a rock to the back of your head. Now, if you want to take a knee during the national anthem and kefetch about 1619 while wearing a jersey sewn by a Uyghur slave with cotton picked by a Uyghur slave, um, yeah, maybe that's that's probably a nicer way to live your life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's called postcard Christianity. Yeah. Or, Satanism. Or, I call it the mystical body of Christ versus the mystical body of Antichrist. And victimism is Antichrist. Right, right. Because it comes, you know, speaking platitudes. Yeah. And just like, yeah, and just like the weakest people to death. And just like you said, the nationalism, sir, in India is fake. It's just a handmaiden of globalism. The nationalism of conservatism in America is fake. It's mostly a handmaiden for globalism. So let's be clear. So they're not going to do anything about the Federal Reserve. They just talk about it. They're not going to do anything about Pfizer. They're going to just talk about it. They're not going to do anything about the border. They might, well, maybe Trump might do a little bit on that, but not much. Uh, they're not going to talk. They're not going to really do anything that it really takes to take the state away from its predation on the human person in America. It's it's a controlled dialectic. And we, we saw what happens when you criticize the war front on, on various issues, especially the one that rules the conservative media today, which is Zionism and it's and it's allegiance to political Israel. You see what happens, you're you know, you you're not allowed to criticize and, that. And you, you know, know why why Zionism criticism. today has revealed itself as the height of victimism. Yeah. Is who is it betraying? Yeah. It's betraying, first and foremost, obviously, the civilians in Gaza, 14,000 children turned to pink dust. Yeah. Unimaginable. Yeah. Um, with weapons purchased from American companies with American money, really heartbreaking. Um, but it's the Israeli people itself. And anti-Semitism and Jew hatred and the fears of the rise of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred are you know, with only 14 million Jews in the world, 7 million in Israel, is something that the we need to be on the watch for. Um, I really think that, and I wrote an article about this way back in November, saying that Palestinians need true friends and the Israelis need true friends. And the only place they can possibly find a real friend is in each other, because the rest of the world likes to use them against each other to achieve objectives that aren't in the interests of the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims and others that live there. And to, to the way that Christian Zionists, especially, have just forgive and turn a blind eye on the hell um, that has been unleashed on the civilians in Gaza, to me, is just, it's, it's sad. It's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. But I always hear Gerard, oh, you thought you were different. You know, yeah. he always says, oh, we always, whenever these enthusiasms of violence or scapegoating yeah. erupt, uh, people always have the same sort of sentiment. Well, why did they? I Jason, we were different. I thought Jason, we were different. Jason, why did they spend two Super Bowl ads, the state of Israel, promoting their war campaign in Gaza? Two Super Bowl ads. And then there was another one, too, that was talking about, you know, get them home. And it's like, of course, you want to get them home. But 
uh, you know, that's victimism is using the plight of victims to go ahead and justify the perpetuation of more victims uh, by, oh, we, well, we have to blow up this whole block of buildings with all the civilians in it because the group that our government funded and put them in power, Hamas, is, is doing horrible atrocities. And don't you like so, how we're supposed to pretend we don't know that either? Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to pretend. And I'm not going to by pretend, the way, everyone so. who challenges me on that <laughs> We'll go, well, yeah, it's true, but, well, but there's no but there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, and here's the reality, right? There's no but Here's there. the reality. Here are our choices. Yeah. Okay? Ethnically cleanse the Jews. Ethnically cleanse the Palestinians. End an apartheid state. Or a two-state solution. What, now I support this. Now, obviously, when you got the U.S., and, and Israel funding Hamas, that makes yeah. this real hard. Yeah. So it makes me think the U.S. and Israel don't want this, this two-state solution. Yeah. Well, well, do they want to end the apartheid state? Well, no, they don't want to end the apartheid state. Do they want to ethnically cleanse the Jews? Well, no, they don't want to ethnically cleanse the Jews. So then what is left? Then I have to believe the goal is to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians. And I'll say on the other side, I'll have people tell me that they don't want a two-state solution. And no, what they really want is to ethnically cleanse the Jews. So we're dealing, we're in a world right now where you've got a lot of people on both sides who their goal, which they won't say out loud, thanks to Jesus Christ, okay? Thanks to Jesus Christ, no one's going to say it out loud. No incarnation of Jesus Christ, they would have no problem saying what their goal is. This is, I don't know if it was you, David, or someone wrote this. This shows you, Gerard helps us understand the triumph of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that was my story. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, that was that World Net Daily, actually. They published it. Yeah, yeah that was so profound, David, yeah. that, that this whole thing helps us understand. Because the reality is there's large groups of people on both sides of the issue that they think ethnic cleansing is the answer. Full stop. 100%. Yeah. They won't say it, though. Okay, so then it's just like, well, it's not this, it's not that, it's not that. It's it's really hard. Well, no. Unless I'm missing something, yeah. it's ethnically cleanse the Jews, ethnically cleanse the Palestinians, and the apartheid state, or a two-state solution. But we're well, so... Yeah, but this we're so Christ, yeah, we're so Christ haunted as a society that they have yes. to market their campaigns under the vulnerable of their own side, right? My vulnerable are the ones being killed the most. And they're like, no, 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 my vulnerable are the ones being hurt the most. And they're like, no, it's mine. Don't you know how much pain we have? That's why we have to kill your vulnerable. And we're not even trying to kill your vulnerable. And then the other side say, hey, we, you know, same thing. It's a mimetic doubling going on, and it's mediated by the terms of Christ. The meek shall inherit the earth. Two thousand years Christ is years king. Ago. You help me see that, yeah. like Christ is king. Yeah. So they got to gaslight us and use victimism, <laughs> but this is the scary part. And sir, yeah. please jump in. Like I wonder if, in a way, Gerard and those Christians who who aren't you know we sort of through the gift that Gerard has given us, are we not pushing the apocalypse <laughs> along faster because? What we're saying is like stop with the lies, like just admit it, right? Like we're 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 unraveling. If we could, if if the word victimism became a word that everyone in, who spoke English understood, and the victimist mess mechanism unraveled, well, then what? It's very interesting, isn't it? Because on one side, like you mentioned, Israel and Palestine. On one side, one side you have uh, Zionist fundamentalists who are trying to accelerate uh, to the point uh, of the arrival of uh, their promised Messiah, and then you have the Muslim side who uh, wants to accelerate uh, to the point where they want the Mahdi to uh, arrive. You know their own version of the Messiah. Uh, but the uh, one movement that really has accelerated. <laughs> towards uh, you know and is fastly doing so is uh, the christian religion you know like and uh, this uh, christianity hardly you know takes the credit for doing that if you ask the average christian or the even the average pastor uh, they would not really say what the implications of jesus christ has been on the history of humanity is that uh, we have now come to a point where thanks to uh, Christianity's influence we have made 
technological advances in medicine and also in uh, things like nuclear bombs, right? And uh, then, but at the same time, we have come to a point where we are very sensitive to that. You know, I, I would say like in, in pre-Christian societies, if pre-Christian civilizations had the nuclear bomb, they would not think so much, you know, uh, before, you know, they would launch those nuclear bombs. They would do it instantly, you know, and they would not stock up their nuclear bombs and uh, make uh, mutual treaties, you know, of things like mutually assured destruction and so on and so forth. Uh, they would not think about those things. They would straight away annihilate their enemies. So this is a very interesting time we're living in. Uh, you're right, Jason. It's it's so fascinating. It's like a crossroads where we have reached the point of no return. Like the, all of these nationalists, uh, they want to go back to some kind of golden age, but they really can't because they, you know, whether you're talking about the nationalists or the globalists, they're always running into an invisible wall bo and it's like they, they fail to acknowledge that wall is Jesus, but they always find themselves running into that wall. They, uh, th that's the reason why they won't say it out loud that they want to et ethnically cleanse the other person because the moment they name that objective that they're doing, what's stopping them from doing it? You know, but the fact that they can't even speak about it says that uh, they ha they really have a battle on their hands. You know, they, they won't be able to do it. You know, to your points, sir, you saying that, here we are in the, in the middle, Christians stuck in the middle. And I would say that Christian Zionisms have abandoned being Christian. They're not Christian in my mind. Practically speaking, they're not. Um, so you, the Zionist fundamentalists know very well that the Islamists would ethnically cleanse them given half a chance. Yes. That's why the appeal to Christians, right? And, and they know that. And the Islamists know that the Zionists would ethnically cleanse them so like that. So their propaganda is mediated towards Christians and Westerners too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wait, Absolutely. The Palestinian propaganda is mediated to is directed towards Westerners and Christians too. They're all trying to get us to. It's all it's we're, all we're directed trying to get the to crooked Christians. ref to make the call for which side's going to win. You know? <laughs> yeah, and you know I've had people on both sides yeah. when I tell them I'm not on their team for. I'm like I'm with you. <laughs> I shared it recently. My favorite line, maybe not Surat's favorite po poet, but one of my favorite is Rudyard Kipling. <laughs> Forgive me. And uh, but, I love Kipling. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, his poem, If, you know, when all men can count on you, but none too much. I want my Jewish friends, my Israeli friends to know that as their friend, and there are, I have friends who are Israeli citizens that I love, that I would do anything for them, for their family, for their friends, for their security, anything. But not too much. I'm not going to be unjust or vile or brutal or cruel. Um and I would say the same thing for to my Palestinian friends, you know, that I want to, I want all men as a Christian man, I want all men to count on me, to be kind, to be gentle, to risk, to risk uh, uh, my interests for their interests as a, a fellow human being. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're stuck as Christians. And I think there's a lot of resentment against us yeah. because people know they can't count on us too much. When I was in Ukraine early on, a Ukrainian friend of mine, I had said something like, if you invaded Russia, I would be in Russia. You know, if NATO unjustly invaded Russia, I would be in Russia right now helping to evacuate Russian civilians. And she goes, no, you wouldn't. You'd be with us if we invaded Russia. I'm like, no, no, nah, I wouldn't. Did Russia you? invaded you. That's why I'm here. You better be careful, no. Jason. <laughs> no, I mean, I run the Vulnerable People Project. Our side is to advocate for civilians trapped in war. Yeah, genocide, no, I hear you. Yeah. You know, and You're that's just not supposed thing. to humanize Russians too, Jason. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah, well. Um, you know, you got, a book to promote. you got a book to promote. You got to get on some big media outlets. You can't I just draw the line with choice the Irish. Bump, okay? Come I on. will never humanize the Irish. Are you, <laughs> or what are you, David? You're Irish and Polish, or what are you? Yeah, I'm German and Polish, which means I'm half evil mastermind and half oh, lovable oaf. David just dodged that. <laughs> oh, you're really not close. Irish then. Okay. <laughs> so, no, like, look, obviously, 
um, the idea that we're, you know, I had said that actually in Ukraine, I was on the front lines and there was a T-72 tank that had been destroyed by Ukrainian forces. And um, I had put my hand on the tank and I had said a prayer for the Russian boys that died in that tank. And I had said that out loud to the people I was with. I said, you know, let's pray for the boys that um, that were inside this tank. I am so grateful because I'm by nature the worst human being I've ever met, you know, and I've met a lot of people. <laughs> and I, I'm pretty I'm pretty quick tempered and uh, addled with prejudice and all that. Um, but it's grace, right? Like when I go to these places, I do. And I know it's by God's grace that my heart breaks for all sides. Um, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, um, I just really love what you said, Sarit, about like the time that we're living in right now is probably one of the most wonderful times to be a Christian yeah. because as everyone's being drawn and quartered, I feel, I think of Stephen a lot, the first martyr who was stoned to death. I would like to be the last. If if this is the end times, if this is it, and we're, or, you know, we're about to close up shop here, I would hope that I'm the last Christian swept away by a mimetic contagion. That's how I think. Like, God, give me the grace. If everyone's being swept away by mimetic contagion, let me be the last Christian stoned, you know, yeah. uh, thrown off a tower or hit with a club. I just please don't let me be swept away by ideologies of of cruelty and hatred and viciousness. Yeah. Yeah. That's our faith. Like I believe grace, you know, is affectatious. And, and that's why, yeah, we have to be careful about the 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 new Paul and the right to abandon the principles. They say, because you've got the fake establishment Romney right, which is its own victimist atrocity of globalism. Yeah. But then you have this new one that's coming out that's supposed to be more punk rock. And, hey, hey, you know, the reason why the right always loses is because they play by the rules, why the left just takes power. And I call them the Little Caesars. You know, their their ideas are as cheap as a Little Caesars $5 pizza. But they but they want to be Little Caesars, and they're, they're dreaming of a Little Caesar to come sweep them off their feet. And it's not very masculine to sit around – pontificating about the rise of their little FDR Caesar who will come and save them. But that's not a Christian disposition to say, well, we've got to start jailing our enemies for anything we can get them for whenever we get power. we got to start, you know, like, no, that's not Christian. That's never going to work. And, You're going to lose. And, and David, back to this point and back to Hindu nationalism, um, you obviously, all of us, I made ourselves pretty clear, we're not Zionists. Yeah. They say that to be, Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. Well, that's absurd. I'm not an anti-Semite. Um, in fact, I think to care about the Jews is to oppose political Zionism. Um, but the rise on the right of anti-Semitism, of Jew hatred, right, which political Zionism foments, like how absurd is it, right, that uh, a Jewish kid who's walking across Harvard Yard gets attacked, usually by, you know, left-wing Jew haters, um, because of something the nation state of Israel does. How stupid would it be if, you know, because in, there's Hindu nationalists are persecuting uh, Christians in India, if I were to smack some Indian kid walking across Harvard Yard, it would be utterly reprehensible and repulsive. But nobody would think to do that, actually. Nobody would think to do that. It's interesting how Jew hatred, anti-Semitism, political Zionism, they're all kind of interwoven. A lot of it has to do with the spokespeople. I saw... The one guy that Candace Owens debated, um, and he had by Barkley. Yeah, he had said, "We, we, 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 we." Like he's not an Israeli, right? So, is he? I don't think he's an Israeli citizen. Um, so, when you have Jewish spokespersons talk about Israel and say "we, we, we," or to be anti, to oppose the actions of the state of Israel is to be anti-Semitic. Like how stupid! I love my country. I oppose it all the time. Um, I love Italy. I, you know, I love Spain. I, you know, doesn't mean I can't criticize their politicians. Um, that I can't. And, and, and by the way, I love my country and our behavior in Iraq and Yemen and Libya and Afghanistan was utterly and absolutely reprehensible, um, undermine our own interests and the interests of those people that live in the countries that we invaded. So in saying so doesn't make me an American hater. It actually means I love my country. Right. Um, 
But but the reason I wanted to go back to this, guys, is, you know, one of the reasons I wrote my book, to your point, David, and I, I kind of swung away from it for a second, is young people in this country have are so authentically aggrieved. They've been so abused by technology. They've been so abused by woke ideology um, that they're angry. A lot of them are being attracted to um, sort of like illiberal right wing Nietzschean right rightist enthusiasms and anti-Semitism and Jew hatred leads a lot of people away from Christianity, which they see as what do they call it? Cuckianity or uh, yeah. what's the word they use? Yeah. Um, Cuckianity. And they, and then where do they go? Because they're striving for the numinous. Well, they're told the original Aryan religion, Hinduism, the religion of your people, blah, blah, blah. So that's one of the reasons I wrote my book. That's one of the reasons I wrote my article. I want to show young men, especially that have been aggrieved. They've been bombarded with pornography. They've been called every name in the book since the moment they fell out of the womb. They've been abused by their teachers and mobs and the media and everyone um, the last thing I want to see them do is reject Jesus Christ, um, to be attracted to Nietzsche or Heidegger or, or towards, um, virulent, uh, any other virulent ideology. And even their interest in Hinduism is, is very shallow. It's more a dilettante, like grasping for a numinous reality to clothe their racial hatred with. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, it's so it's so blatant. Like the the this interest in Hinduism isn't real, isn't a real interest at all. So when you are like when you see people studying these Hindu texts or you know these Hindu twa texts, uh, there's no serious question about okay, is did these gods uh, that these Hindus worship did they really create me? And uh, if they did, why are we so separate uh, from these gods? Because these gods uh, are biologically very different. They have so many uh, different markers, and they they seem to be very this they seem to be very rivalrous with the with creation. I mean, if there's a creator, right? If there is a creator, I wouldn't say that creator would be rivalrous with the thing he created. That would be ridiculous. So why are these many gods? Why are they so rivalrous with uh with the with human beings? Why are they going to war with human beings? Like if you just imagine a modern day uh, like in in modern day setting, a god going to war with the human beings dressed in all camouflage and uh, you know helmets and all of it, it would look ridiculous. It's ridiculous. That's how exactly these mythologies portray their gods as. And uh, the reason why they do that is because they want to hide the violence that human human beings do, do to themselves and they dress it up you know in these uh abstract div divinized figures right that's why you see all of these deities with uh you know things like all of these different multiple arms and so on and so forth they, they the reason that they are made like that so as to set human beings apart from something from the victim that they have ritually murdered and then deified and then made abstract oh. so that you know you you know, right? It's 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 the classic Girardian uh, interpretation of mythology. So there's no real question, uh, serious question. Uh, I mean, you can see the proto. You can see a vestige of the proto beginnings of the Hindu religion in the more rural communities of India, in which uh, the National Enquirer will report every now and then a one-eyed cyclops goat baby born, and they take the goat, and you have photos of it in the village, and they parade it around as a god. So that's a that's a vestige of the origin of a lot of these gods are these people with disabilities. You know, you see these people that are preserved in the uh, down the road here in Florida. We have Gibsonton, which is a very Girardian town. It was the place where all the so-called circus freaks retired. Giant man was married to a little girl who was like two foot as an adult, and uh, the giant boot is still there. And there's, you know, if you, you, you know, when I went over there, you go to the 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 restaurant to get a burger. Maybe the bearded lady serves you. It's a, it's a whole you know, it's a very Girardian community in its origin. 
as a retired circus performers, but they had the spider girl and stuff. You can imagine those folks being born in a, in a thousands of years ago, they would have been deified. So there's a reason why we get folks with different hands and different arms and stuff, bent and backwards spider girl. You ever seen, have you heard of a lobster man? Lobster guy, he had his hands were disfigured like a lobster. He ended up murdering someone. He was a, he turned he got he was enraged. He was enraged with uh with a murderous envy because he didn't have hands that were normal in the way that we think of hands. So there's a lot of this resentment, a lot of this uh uh the deification of the monst of the monstrous other. Like if if Elephant Man had been born five thousand years ago. He wouldn't have been protected in a tower like he was in London. He would have been used as a human sacrifice. You see what I mean? And then yeah. thousands of years later, that would have be maybe become a god or a part of a cult. Well, and then I want to get to that because it's you see this just rage at how Christians are slowing progress. Yeah. Because as you said, David, the whole world is Christ haunted now. So even like the Muslims and the, and, the, and, the, and the Zionist fundamentalists all have to use the language of Christ to appeal to us. Yeah. Um, so this is this, this desire to throw off Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's it's like it's just the world's like a, a raging bull yeah. trying to throw a rider, the rider. Right. The bull, that's what that's back. what Jesus describes. You just described the metaphor that he gives to Paul when he encounters them on the road to Damascus. He says, it's hard for thee to kick against the goads. It's a re reference to the ox when they're saddled with the goads. You can't kick. The, if you kick it, you can't escape the yoke of the chariot. So, yeah, you just described oh, what Jesus Oh, well, that's is. what the world is, right? And, and I, you know, the, there's no left or right left amongst our elite. They're just progressives. Right. And by progress, they mean technological progress, transhumanist. Uh, they mean to put as much space between... The, you know our our human nature and whatever homo what is it homo deus what do they call yeah. it um, yeah uh what is that Yuval's uh what is it um homo Yuval sapiens harari. no Yuval harari uh, uh this new god man that they would like to create right um they want to put as much space between the human person and this this new techno god homo man. yeah homo techno homo um <laughs> Homo Deus. I'm not calling you Vol that, okay? Come on, guys. We, we're not calling him a, 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 a techno. <laughs> I'll use that curse word from now on. <laughs> we're just trying to get the term he used right, and I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, well, you know, in the in the in Eastern Europe and across the Middle East, young kids, maybe it's the same in India, but the, the young they refer to the West or Americans and Europeans as homo globalists. Yeah. Homo globalism. Yep. A well, global homo, yeah. Well, well global so, homo. Global so, Jason, homo. if we are you saying if we buy your book, we're going to beat the Great Reset? Is that all we got to do? I'm going to say that if you don't buy my book, you will eat cricket meat, <laughs> and you'll hate it. So, if you don't want to eat cricket meat, listen, you got to buy my book. It's the only way for your you. Your book not is to not printed by the labor of Uyghurs in China, is it? Come on, no, it is not. There was no Uyghur labor, slave labor. There is zero cobalt in my book. I, I I made sure of that. I said I want no cobalt in my book. Nor there's no lithium in my book. And you're not showing up with a Tesla Cybertruck when you do signings. Probably some right? petroleum in the cover of my book. What's that? <laughs> you're not you're not showing up to book signings in the Tesla truck, are you? Cybertruck. No, no. My goal is to destroy the electric vehicle, which I call the blood vehicle. That you're would not you're not sponsored by big oil, are you? No, I mean, I'd like to be, though. So if you're from big oil, <laughs> listen, I could use your money. I got a lot of things I can say. I love oil. Yeah, I love big oil. You know, the internal combustion engine is an environmental savior. It saved yeah. us from horse crap, yeah. which was very bad for the human ecology. Yeah, And, uh, you know, when you go to cities like New York and Chicago and Boston, the reason why your front door, you have to walk up the steps to go to your front doors because when that house was built, uh, the streets were covered in horse crap and flies. And so, you know, the internal combustion engine was an environmental savior. And it is, again, it's, you know, it's going to save us from this menace that is the electric vehicle with its heavy, toxic batteries. Um, 
and it's human slave labor that's dependent on the creation of those batteries. So to destroy the electric vehicle, which, by the way, it's in, it's in uh, full collapse, the EV market is an absolute collapse because the product sucks. Um, but beyond that, it's a human rights catastrophe. The only reason that there is an EV market is because of the gov you know, government subsidies and propaganda campaigns. No one would buy a less efficient uh, environmental and human catastrophe of a vehicle, which is if you're driving an EV right now, you need to just go sell it yeah. and take a hot shower to, you know, wash the guilt off your body. Um, and then go buy my book, The Great Campaign Against the Great Reset. I, 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 I map out the five principles that we need to advance against the five ideologies yeah. And five ideological tactics of the globalists. Yeah. Well, Jason, you're one of the few people I know who's able to get on uh, some uh, significant platforms who's not an obvious uh, Fed or Intel asset. So I really appreciate you doing what you're doing. And it's probably I'm glad it's not obvious. I work hard at being discreet. <laughs> I, I do want to say if you need anybody <laughs> to, I don't think the only country, the only continent you don't have representation of your campaign is probably Antarctica. And I'll be glad to take. The vulnerable people project to antarctica if you want if you don't mind you know we work all over the world and we do not yet work in antarctica but i've been told there are 40 million people living there and it's some kind of like oh boy <laughs> david just changed his mind right there <laughs> yeah, all right, I, I'll, is this I, a q anon <laughs> conspiracy david is that why you want to go are you going to investigate it for no, q no, or no. why no, uh, what happens in Antarctica stays in Antarctica, obviously, okay? Because what happens in Antarctica stays in Antarctica. That's why I get to keep going back. Yeah. Listen, I've kept my mouth shut about you know how great it is there. The water parks are amazing, the chicken wings are amazing. So listen, the, the, the what I wrote this book for young people, especially, but it is a Girardian, it is to the Girardian lens for sure. Like so much so that I even feel guilty writing the book because it's so much Gerard, you know, mm -hmm. it's an echo of Gerard and whatever's crappy about it, it's me. Mm -hmm. But, um, but what the one thing I wanted to convey to young men, especially and young women, it's that what you have before you is the adventure of Eros that we will defeat the great reset, but the way to defeat it is really erotic love, thoughtfulness to our posterity and, and, and thoughtfulness to our ancestors. And so what do I mean by that? First and foremost, it's love of God and love of family. The Great Reset seeks to destroy our natural affections. And so if you want to battle back against the Great Reset, well, it's very easy, really. Love God, <laughs> worship God, love your parents and honor your parents. Um, love your family. Seek to be a useful member of your community. Um, if you're young, when you're young, preserve your moral imagination so that you can love the way you were created to love, not only your creator, but that erotic love, which drives human life, which is the love of your spouse. And so avoid, avoid pornography and promiscuity, shake it off to the best of your ability. Young people, I know that that's like saying, you know, okay, sure. And I'll walk through a cotton field in Velcro and I won't, I won't. I uh, get any cotton on my Velcro suit either. You know, I know in, in today's world, pre preserving one's moral imagination for a young person to experience Eros in a marital love is a great challenge. It's the adventure. That's why I say in my uh, my introduction to young Americans that what you have before you is the adventure of Eros, the adventure of erotic love. Because when you fall in love, get married, Together with your spouse, you will have children, procreate, have lots of children. The Great Reset hates that. The globalists hate that. And order your life to love your children and order your life to leave your posterity a civilization of love and a culture of life. This is how we beat back the Great Reset. And maybe for our generations, gentlemen, uh, we'll have to just quote Frodo and say that we'll save the Shire, but not for us. And I'm fine with that because... You know, to quote St. Augustine, I've already, I've ate, I've had more than my fair share of peaches and not all of them were in trees in my yard. I've lived a blessed and privileged life. Um, and so now what I'm called to do is really just order my life to serve my posterity. And this great battle is to free our posterity from an Orwellian hell that has never, like has never existed on the planet. That's what we're fighting for. What we, we can close out the rest of our life 
and pl hedonistic pleasure, transhumanist technologies. We can consume our way into the grave with all the gusto of a 19 year old boy if we want. Um, but yeah, that's not how we're to live. We're just to order our life, uh, to serve our posterity. And in doing that, we we will we will beat back and break the Great Reset. Klaus Schwab isn't beating us. No way. Oh, very good. Amen. We gotta let we gotta let Christ finish his story. That's what we're doing. That's it. History. His story. Right. Yes. So anything you want to say? Uh I I can't top that. Uh just want to say it's been a pleasure talking to you, gentlemen, and uh Hope to have more discussions with you. Uh, Jason, uh, I would like to say, take care of yourself on your future journeys and don't be too eager to become a martyr. We need your friendship and your love. I really appreciate it, sir. Hopefully, maybe I can see you in India and I'd love to have you on my podcast. Well, sure, um, sure. Yeah, and trust sure. me, I don't want to be a martyr. I love sushi mm -hmm. and Muay Thai too much and my family too much. Yeah. Very good. The Great Campaign Against the Great Reset by Jason Jones, folks. Get it. I'll pre-order it now so we can uh, uh, get this game started here. Let's go. Let's pre-order it. Let's drive me up. My goal is in two weeks to be number one on Amazon. All right. Let's do that. Right now, where am I? I'm like number 30,000. So we got to have 30,000 space. I am number one in my category for wish list, I think, which is good. I was yesterday. So I really, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a writer, and you'll hear a lot of people say like awards or numbers don't mean anything. They mean everything to me because um, how you beat the Great Reset is a global cordon. A cordon is a military operation where you surround a village and nothing gets in and nothing gets out. Yeah. And the globalists have surrounded us in this global cordon. How you break a cordon, I'm a former infantryman, is everyone pushes out against the coordinate and the direction they're facing. So if a village is surrounded, the villagers push out and break the cordon. Yeah. Um, so I want this book. It's already going to be published in Spanish and Portuguese. And we're negotiations for German and yeah. Japanese and um, Dari. You do it in Indian. I, I see Surat uh, as the uh, C.S. Lewis of India in the making. Watch. Oh, I Watch love it, it in Indian. I, I, I love Surat to write the intro and get it out there i'm really excited about the portuguese and spanish edition because this is how we defeat the globalists we we push out in every direction um i just want surat's children david your children my children and grandchildren to live beautiful simple humane and dignified lives that's what this battle is about very good take care jason thank you god bless guys